desk written by Saki. It's a pen name of Hector Hughes Munro. Though he was born in Burma, most of his life he lived in England. And early in his career, Munro became a police officer, but he couldn't continue in the office of being a police because of some health issues. Therefore, he turned to writing, which was his passion. And as a storyteller, he has made much impact in the literature. And this chapter named Desk is an example for the same. In this lesson, actually, Saki is telling us about the consequences of a man named Norman Godsby facing because of his habit of making very quick judgments, assumptions. It is said that we should not judge a book by its cover page. Very often we judge people looking at their appearances, looking at their dress patterns, dress codes, etc. Sometimes our assumptions will be wrong and we will make grave mistakes. This lesson tells us about this experience of Norman Godsby. Let's see what he experienced. Norman Godsby sat on the bench in the park with his back to a strip of bush planted sword, fenced by the park railings and the row fronting him across a wild stretch of carriage drive. So Norman is sitting down uh, in a, on a bench and it's a park and in front of him there is a carriage drive that is going. And now what happens? Hyde Park Corner with its rattle and hoot of traffic lay immediately to his right. So the setting is clear. He is sitting down on a bench in a park and Hyde Park Corner is, uh, is actually rattling with traffic. So it's the middle of the city actually. It was some 30 minutes past 6 on an early March evening and dusk had fallen heavily over the scene. Dusk mitigated by some faint moonlight and many street lamps. So the setting is clear. It's an evening hour wherein the sun is almost setting and uh, uh, the dusk is just reduced by some faint moonlight and many street lamps. So this is time when Norman is uh, sitting down on a bench in the park. There was a wild emptiness over road and sidewalk and yet there were many unconsidered figures moving silently through the half light. Now the author is explaining about what's happening in that street, in that uh, park. Though it is uh, dusk and uh, almost sun is setting, uh, there is a lot of emptiness is felt. And yet there are some unconsidered figures moving silently through the half light. Unconsidered figures. We can't make out who they are. They are not very important figures. They are moving and in this half light. The scene pleased God's way and harmonized with his present mood. Desk to his mind was an hour of the defeated. The person who, who is sitting down on the bench in the park. God's way, this scene is very pleasing. It is harmonizing with his mood. And according to him, Desk is a time of the defeated. 
men and women who had fought and lost who hid their fallen fortunes and dead hopes as far as possible from the scrutiny of the curious came forth in this hour of blooming when their shabby clothes and bowed shoulders and unhappy eyes might pass unnoticed or at any rate unrecognized so for god's way this evening our desk is a time is the hour of the defeated when many people men and women alike those who have had a fallen fortune or their hopes are dead and uh, those faces which are gloomy those people with shabby clothes and bowed shoulders and happy eyes they are walking along this street beside the park unnoticed by people or rather they don't want to get recognized unrecognized so this is a situation that he experiences in the park beyond the sheltering screen of bushes and palings came a realm of brilliant lights and noisy rushing traffic meanwhile on the other side of the park we will find a lot of rushing traffic a blazing many tired stretch of windows shone through the desk and almost dispersed it making marking the horns of those other people who held their own in life struggle or at any rate had not had to admit failure so here he makes a comparison between people who, who never faced a failure those who are always successful maybe the busy street represents such people and here also he compares uh, the people who are walking in this little light of the desk those people who are unnoticed and unrecognized so god's please imagination pictured things as he sat on his bench in the almost deserted walk he was in the mood to count himself among the defeated so he also felt that he should also count himself along with the people who are defeated those who are discouraged money troubles did not press on him had he so wished he could have strolled into the thoroughfare of light and noise and taken his place among the jostling ranks of those who enjoyed prosperity or struggling for it he had failed in the more subtle ambition and for the moment he was heart sore and disillusioned so he thought for a moment about himself he could have ranked himself along with people who are successful those people uh, who have str- uh, those people uh, who are pressing towards success uh, those people uh, of jostling ranks who enjoyed prosperity or those people who are struggling to enjoy prosperity but at this moment he, he himself feels that he is also along with the defeated and uh, he is heart sore and disillusioned disillusioned means disappointed on the bench by his side sat an elderly gentleman with a drooping air of defiance that was probably the remaining vestige of self respect in an individual who had ceased to defy successfully anybody or anything so along with him beside him came and sat a gentleman elderly man looking at him uh, the uh, god's face telling that he was probably uh, an individual who was not successful probably he is a defeated person his clothes could scarcely be called shabby at least they passed muster in the half light he belonged unmistakably to that forlorn orchestra to whose piping no one dances forlorn orchestra means sad orchestra to whose piping no one dances he is also along the band of people who are unrecognized unsuccessful etc 
As he rose to go, God's way imagined him returning to a home circle where he was snubbed and of no account. God's way thought to himself that this person is not even considered at home, not respected. He is snuffed. He is of no account at home. His retreating figure vanished slowly in the shadows and his place on the bench was taken almost immediately by a young man fairly well dressed but scarcely more cheerful of mien than his predecessor as soon as this elderly man left the place walked into the dark what happens another young person comes and sa- sa- comes and sits near the near gospel and this young gentleman seems to be much more cheerful than the prede- the predecessor earlier man as if to emphasize the fact that the whole the world went badly with him the newcomer unburdened himself of an angry and very audible expletive as he flung himself into the seat so he wanted to express himself that as if he is not happy something has gone wrong in his world he was trying to express himself as he was coming down to sit on the bench you don't seem in very good temper says godsby judging that he was expected to take due notice of the demonstration the young man turned to him with a look of disarming frankness which put him instantly on his guard you wouldn't be in a good temper if you were in the fix i am in he said i have done the silliest thing i have ever done in my life so what's be is asking i think you are not in a good temper you are not in a good mood what happened and the young man is telling if you are to be in my position if you were to be uh, f- facing the same situation that i am in you wouldn't you wouldn't be in a good mood good temper yes said god speed dispassionately without emotions and the young man is trying to explain himself came up this afternoon meaning to say meaning to stay at the patagonian hotel in berkshire square continued the young man when i got there i found it had been pulled down some weeks ago and a cinema theater runs up on the site so this young man came down to stay in patagonian hotel but when he reached the spot he found that the hotel is no more there and instead a cinema theater is running in that place the taxi driver recommended me to another hotel some way off and went there i just sent a letter to my people giving them the address and then i went out to buy some soap okay so the taxi driver suggested another hotel and he went there as soon as he went there he wrote a letter to his near near ones dear ones telling that i am here in this hotel etc sending them the address and then he goes out to buy a soap bathing soap for himself i just sent a letter to my people giving them the address and then i went out to buy some soap I had forgotten to pack any and I hate using hotel soap. Then I strolled about a bit, had a drink at the bar and looked at the shops and when I came to turn my steps back to the hotel, I suddenly realized that I didn't remember its name or even what street it was in. So he went out to buy soap. He had some money in pocket. He went to the bar, had a drink. He did a bit of window shopping uh, and then when he wanted to get back to this hotel he forgot he literally forgot where this hotel was what's the name of the hotel and also the address i suddenly realized that i didn't remember its name or even what street it was in there's a nice predicament for a fellow who hasn't any friends or connections in london of course i can wire to my people for the address but they won't have got my letter till tomorrow meanwhile i am without any money came out with about a shilling on me which went in buying the soap and getting the drink and here i am 
wandering about with two pens in my pocket and nowhere to go for the night. So this is the predicament that this young person is in. He has lost uh, the way. Uh, he does not know how to get back to the hotel. He does not have even the money. Only two pens is remaining with him and the rest is spent already on soap and the drink. And uh, here he doesn't know anyone. He doesn't have any friends. This is a, a strange land for him. There was an eloquent pause after the story had been told. I suppose you think I have spun you rather than an impossible yarn, said the young man presently with a suggestion of resentment in his voice. The young man told Godsby, Okay, Godsby, you, you may think that I have uh, made up a story, spun, uh, spun a story like that, okay? Uh, spunning an impossible yarn means that, okay? Spunning means uh, making up a uh, cooked up story. Not at all impossible, said Godsby ju judiciously. I remember doing exactly the same thing once in a foreign capital and on that occasion there were two of us which made it more remarkable. Luckily we remembered that the hotel was on a sort of canal and when we struck the canal we were able to find out our way back to the hotel. So Godsby is also telling this young man, okay this could happen to any one of us. Once uh, when I was on a journey uh, along with my friend, it's happened to me. The youth brightened at the reminiscence. Reminiscence the means this memory. In a foreign city, I wouldn't mind so much, he said. One could go to one's council and get the requisite help from him. Here, in one's own land, one is far more derelict if one gets into a fix. Unless I can find some decent chap to swallow my story and lend me some money, I, I seem likely to spend the night on the embarkment. I am glad anyhow that you don't think the story outrageously improbable. So he says, yeah, it's okay. Sometimes in the foreign land it happens, but in one's own land, when it happens, it is a disappointing fact. And uh, if I don't get anyone believe in my story, I may have and uh, lend me some money for time being. I may have to stay this night in the street itself. He threw a good deal of warmth into the last remark as though perhaps to indicate his hope that God's way did not fall far short of the requisite decency. Of course, said God's way slowly, the weak point of your story is that you can't produce a soap. For God's way is actually feeling with him at the same time God's way is questioning him. Okay, of course, you went out to buy soap and where is the soap now? You don't if you produce a soap, your argument will be much more appealing. The young man sat forward hurriedly, felt rapidly in the pockets of his overcoat and then jumped to his feet. So the gentleman is trying to find out where the soap is, okay? Uh, he is checking in his overcoat, he doesn't find it, he is, he is checking on the floor, so suppose it has fallen down. He doesn't find it. I must have lost it, he muttered angrily. To lose a hotel and a cake of soap on one afternoon suggests willful carelessness, said Gorsby. But the young man scarcely waited to hear the end of this remark. He flitted away down the path, his head held high with an air of somewhat jaded jauntiness. So, you know, uh, jauntiness means a self-confident manner. Uh, when Godspeed said to miss the soap and hotel at the same time, uh, it is a bit of, you know, carelessness and he was almost being questioned on how did he miss all these things. And before waiting to hear the last uh, words of the sentence that uh, Godspeed said, the gentleman started walking down the path, his head held high with an air of somewhat jaded jauntiness. It was a pity, mused Godsby. The going out to get one's own soap was the one convincing touch in the whole story. And yet, it was just that little detail that brought him to grief. If he had had the brilliant forethought to provide himself with a cake of soap, 
wrapped and sealed with all the solicitude of the chemist counter he would have been a genius in his particular line so god's be telling okay he had a good argument to present at the same time if he were to present along with the argument the soap with the chemist count uh, chemist solicitude uh, or the bill from the chemist etc it would have been more appealing and more believable with that reflection god's be rose to go as he did so an exclamation of concern escaped him lying on the ground besides the bench was a small oval packet wrapped and sealed with the solicitude of the chemist counter it could be nothing else but a cake of soap and it had evidently fallen out of the youth's overcoat pocket when he flung himself down on the seat in another moment godsby was an anxious quest for the youthful figure in a light overcoat so with me all this godsby also got up from his seat when he got up from the seat he found that a uh, uh, cake uh, a piece of cake like you know a cake of soap is lying down on the floor and evidently he thought that this is the soap that uh, this young person missed so he goes in search of the youthful figure in the light overcoat he had nearly given up the search when he caught sight of the object of his pursuit standing irresolutely on the border of the carriage drive he turned round sharply when he found gorsby hailing him he thought he almost missed him but at the same time he found him the important witness to the genuineness of your story has turned up said gorsby holding out the cake of soap it must have slid out of your overcoat pocket when you sat down on the seat i saw it on the ground after you left you must excuse my disbelief but appearances were really rather against you and now as i appealed to the testimony of the soap i think i ought to abide by the verdict if the loan of the sovereign is any good to you the young man hastily removed all doubts on the subject by pocketing the coin here's my card with my address continued gorsby so as soon as he found the gentleman said soap is an evident evidence that you are truthful and you have really missed the hotel and uh, now i can help you out with giving you a bit of money to get back to the hotel to find the hotel and once you are okay uh, gorsby has given him the address in his card and said any day this week will do for returning the money and here is a soap don't lose it again it has been a good friend to you giving back the soap he said lucky thing you finding it said the youth and then with a catch in his voice he blurted out a word or two of thanks and fled headlong in the direction of nights bridge saying a few words of thanks immediately he left and he disappeared in the dark in the direction of the nights bridge poor boy he is nearly as possible broke down said gorsby to himself it's a lesson to me not to be too clever in judging by circumstances so uh, gorsby is telling to himself a uh, dialogue to himself he says it's a lesson to me not to be too clever in judging by circumstances don't judge anyone by circumstances as gorsby re- retraced his steps past the seat where the little drama had taken place he saw an elderly gentleman poking and peering beneath it and on all sides of it and recognized his earlier fellow occupant so as god's bay went back to his seat where he was sitting earlier he found the gentleman elderly gentleman who was sitting along with him in the beginning of the story he is there poking and peering beneath the bench and the searching all around on sides of the bench uh, for something then uh, gods we asked this elderly gentleman have you lost anything sir he asked then elderly gentleman tells gods we yes sir 
a cake of soap my dear friends i hope you have understood this uh, lesson uh, wherein uh, sakhi is trying to tell us through the interesting story of uh, godsby and uh, this young man not to judge anyone by circumstances and uh, also sometimes we are too judgmental about people uh, and we have to be careful about uh, making judgments about uh, events and situations and also we should be prudent in making judgments because we are living in a world wherein there are a lot of frauds existing a lot of fraudulent things happen people uh, take us for granted and take us for a ride we have to be very very careful and we have to be prudent enough to handle such situations otherwise we will be thoroughly fooled thoroughly uh, taken for a ride and we will lose our money and energy thanks a lot god bless you by Saki There was an eloquent pause after the story had been told I suppose you think I've spun you rather an impossible yarn said the young man presently with a suggestion of resentment in his voice Hmm not at all impossible said Gortsby judicially I remember doing exactly the same thing once in a foreign capital and on that occasion there were two of us which made it more remarkable luckily we remembered that the hotel was on a sort of canal and when we struck the canal we were able to find our way back to the hotel the youth brightened at the reminiscence ah, in a foreign city i wouldn't mind so much he said one could go to one's consul and get the requisite help from him Here in one's own land one is far more derelict if one gets into a fix unless i can find some decent chap to swallow my story and lend me some money <sighs> i seem likely to spend the night on the embankment i'm glad anyhow that you don't think the story outrageously improbable he threw a good deal of warmth into the last remark as though perhaps to indicate his hope that godspy did not fall far short of the requisite decency mm, of course said godspy slowly the weak point of your story is that you can't produce the soap the young man sat forward hurriedly felt rapidly in the pockets of his overcoat and then jumped to his feet i must have lost it he muttered angrily to lose a hotel and a cake of soap on one afternoon suggests willful carelessness said godsby but the young man scarcely waited to hear the end of the remark he flitted away down the path his head held high with an air of somewhat jaded jauntiness it was a pity mused godsby the going out to get one's own soap was the one convincing touch in the whole story 
and yet it was just that little detail that brought him to grief. If he had had the brilliant forethought to provide himself with a cake of soap, wrapped and sealed with all the solicitude of the chemist's counter, he would have been a genius in his particular line. With that reflection, Gortsby rose to go. As he did so, an exclamation of concern escaped him. Lying on the ground beside the bench was a small oval packet wrapped and sealed with the solicitude of a chemist's counter. It could be nothing else but a cake of soap and it had evidently fallen out of the youth's overcoat pocket when he flung himself down on the seat. In another moment, Gortsby was in anxious quest for a youthful figure in a light overcoat. He had nearly given up the search when he caught sight of the object of his pursuit standing irresolutely on the border of the carriage drive. He turned round sharply when he found Gortsby hailing him. The important witness to the genuineness of your story has turned up, said Gortsby holding out the cake of soap. It must have slid out of your overcoat pocket when you sat down on the seat. I saw it on the ground after you left. <laughs> you must excuse my disbelief, but appearances were really rather against you. And now, as I appealed to the testimony of the soap, I think I ought to abide by its verdict. If the loan of a sovereign is any good to you, the young man hastily removed all doubt on the subject by pocketing the coin. Here is my card with my address, continued Gortsby. Any day this week will do for returning the money. And <laughs> here is the soap. Don't lose it again. It's been a good friend to you. <laughs> Lucky thing you finding it, said the youth. And then, with a catch in his voice, he blurted out a word or two of thanks and fled headlong in the direction of Knightsbridge. Ah, poor boy. He as nearly as possible broke down, said Gortsby to himself. It's a lesson to me not to be too clever in judging by circumstances. As Gortsby retraced his steps past the seat where the little drama had taken place, he saw an elderly gentleman poking and peering beneath it and on all sides of it and recognized his earlier fellow occupant. Uh, have you lost anything, sir? He asked. Um, yes, sir. Uh, a cake of soap. Norman Gortsby sat on a bench in the park, with his back to a strip of bush-planted sward, fenced by the park railings and the row fronting him across a wide stretch of carriage drive. Hyde Park Corner, with its rattle and hoot of traffic, lay immediately to his right. It was some 30 minutes past six on an early March evening and dusk had fallen heavily over the scene. Dusk mitigated by some faint moonlight and many street lamps. There was a wide emptiness over road and sidewalk. And yet, there were many unconsidered figures moving silently through the half-light. The scene pleased Gortsby and harmonized with his present mood. Dusk, to his mind, was the hour of the defeated. Men and women who had fought and lost, who hid their fallen fortunes and dead hopes as far as possible from the scrutiny of the curious, came forth in this hour of gloaming when their shabby clothes and bowed shoulders and unhappy eyes might pass unnoticed. 
or at any rate unrecognized. Beyond the sheltering screen of bushes and palings came a realm of brilliant lights and noisy rushing traffic. A blazing many-tiered stretch of windows shone through the dusk and almost dispersed it, marking the haunts of those other people who held their own in life's struggle or at any rate had not had to admit failure. So Gottsby's imagination pictured things as he sat on his bench in the almost deserted walk. He was in the mood to count himself among the defeated. Money troubles did not press on him. Had he so wished, he could have strolled into the thoroughfares of light and noise and taken his place among the jostling ranks of those who enjoyed prosperity or struggled for it. He had failed in a more subtle ambition and for the moment he was heart sore and disillusioned. On the bench by his side sat an elderly gentleman with a drooping air of defiance that was probably the remaining vestige of self-respect in an individual who had ceased to defy successfully anybody or anything. His clothes could scarcely be called shabby. At least they passed muster in the half-light. He belonged unmistakably to that forlorn orchestra to whose piping no one dances. As he rose to go, Gortsby imagined him returning to a home circle where he was snubbed and of no account. His retreating figure vanished slowly into the shadows and his place on the bench was taken almost immediately by a young man, fairly well-dressed, but scarcely more cheerful of mien than he his predecessor. As if to emphasize the fact that the world went badly with him, the newcomer unburdened himself of an angry and very audible expletive as he flung himself into the seat. You don't seem in a very good temper, said Gortsby, judging that he was expected to take due notice of the demonstration. The young man turned to him with a look of disarming frankness, which put him instantly on his guard. You won't be in a good temper if you were in the fix I'm in, he said. I've done the silliest thing I've ever done in my life. Yes? said Gortsby dispassionately. Came up this afternoon, meaning to stay at the Patagonian Hotel in Berkshire Square. Continued the young man. When I got there, I found it had been pulled down some weeks ago and a cinema theatre run up on the site. The taxi driver recommended me to another hotel some way off and I went there. I just sent a letter to my people, giving them the address and then I went out to buy some soap. I'd forgotten to pack any and I hate using hotel soap. Then I strolled back to the hotel. I suddenly realized that I didn't remember its name or even what street it was in. There's a nice predicament for a fellow who hasn't any friends or connections in London. Of course, I can wire to my people for the address, but they won't have got my letter till tomorrow. Meantime, I'm without any money. Came out with about a shilling on me, which went in buying the soap. And uh, here I am, wandering about with two pens in my pocket and nowhere to go for the night. There was an eloquent pause after the story had been told. I suppose you think I've spun you rather an impossible yarn, said the young man presently with a suggestion of resentment in his voice. Hmm, not at all impossible, said Gortsby judicially. I remember doing exactly the same thing once in a foreign capital. And on that occasion, there were two of us, which made it more remarkable. Luckily, we remembered that the hotel was on a sort of canal 
and when we struck the canal we were able to find our way back to the hotel the youth brightened at the reminiscence <sighs> in a foreign city i wouldn't mind so much he said one could go to one's consul and get the requisite help from him here in one's own land one is far more derelict if one gets into a fix unless i can find some decent chap to swallow my story and lend me some money <sighs> i seem likely to spend the night on the embankment i'm glad anyhow that you don't think the story outrageously improbable he threw a good deal of warmth into the last remark as though perhaps to indicate his hope that godspeed did not fall far short of the requisite decency mm, of course said godsby slowly the weak point of your story is that you can't produce the soap the young man sat forward hurriedly felt rapidly in the pockets of his overcoat and then jumped to his feet i must have lost it he muttered angrily to lose a hotel and a cake of soap on one afternoon suggests willful carelessness said godsby but the young man scarcely waited to hear the end of the remark he flitted away down the path his head held high with an air of somewhat jaded jauntiness it was a pity mused godsby the going out to get one's own soap was the one convincing touch in the whole story and yet it was just that little detail that brought him to grief if he had had the brilliant forethought to provide himself with a cake of soap wrapped and sealed with all the solicitude of the chemist's counter he would have been a genius in his particular line with that reflection godsby rose to go as he did so an exclamation of concern escaped him lying on the ground beside the bench was a small oval packet wrapped and sealed with the solicitude of a chemist's counter it could be nothing else but a cake of soap and it had evidently fallen out of the youth's overcoat pocket when he flung himself down on the seat in another moment godsby was in anxious quest for a youthful figure in a light overcoat he had nearly given up the search when he caught sight of the object of his pursuit standing irresolutely on the border of the carriage drive he turned round sharply when he found godsby hailing him the important witness to the genuineness of your story has turned up said godsby holding out the cake of soap it must have slid out of your overcoat pocket when you sat down on the seat I saw it on the ground after you left. <laughs> you must excuse my disbelief, but appearances were really rather against you. And now, as I appealed to the testimony of the soap, I think I ought to abide by its verdict. If the loan of a sovereign is any good to you, the young man hastily removed all doubt on the subject by pocketing the coin. Here is my card with my address. continued godsby any day this week will do for returning the money and ha, here is the soap don't lose it again it's been a good friend to you <laughs> lucky thing you finding it said the youth and then with a catch in his voice he blurted out a word or two of thanks and fled headlong in the direction of knightsbridge ah <sighs> poor boy He as nearly as possible broke down," said Godsby to himself. "It's a lesson to me not to be too clever in judging by circumstances." As Godsby retraced his steps past the seat where the little drama had taken place, he saw an elderly gentleman poking and peering beneath it and on all sides of it and recognized his earlier fellow occupant. Have you lost anything sir? he asked. Um yes sir, a cake of soap.